So the first question is, a ball is struck at time t equals zero and follows a parabolic path shown in the diagram above. The following graph shows the following graphs show quantities possibly associated with the motion as a function of time t, as that air resistance, assume that air resistance is negligible and that positive directions are upward and to the right. So the first question is, which graph represents the horizontal component of the velocity of the ball? We know that the only force acting on this object as it follows this path is the force of gravity. So that's gonna be directed downward, right, on this ball here which would mean the only component of velocity that's going to be affected is the vertical component, which is going to have some effect. But the horizontal component is always going to stay constant. So if we launched it with some certain velocity at a theta from the horizontal, this component of the velocity will always stay constant. So looking at our options, A shows that the velocity was increasing and decreasing. That would imply there's acceleration in that direction. That's clearly not true, so it cannot be A. B also says that the slope is non-zero, right? A is non-zero, which is not true. Same thing with C, same thing with D, because these all have some sort of slope, so it has to be E, because that's the only one with a slope of zero, which would imply no acceleration, and that makes sense, again, because force of gravity is directed completely downward. So for one, it's gonna be E. All right, number two says, which of the graphs could re possibly represent the horizontal velocity um, of the ball. So the important thing to note is that the force of gravity is constant as it applies it throughout the path that follows. So the vertical component of the velocity, right, if I were to take its slope, it is going to have to stay constant, which means here I have a deferring acceleration, right, one acceleration here and after some time the acceleration changes. That makes no sense because the slopes here for some reason is positive and negative here which would imply that the acceleration has changed that's not possible uh, for b same thing it's not possible and e implies that the acceleration was zero and in this case acceleration is supposed to be equal to g so cannot be e so we're going to have to have a constant slope now so we're narrowed it down to c and d and to pick the correct option if you read this it says assume that the positive direction is upward right which would imply that because our initial velocity was upward, right, we first went up and then we came down, we have to start at a positive y-intercept. So it cannot be C because this says that at time t equals zero, we started off going down. That doesn't make any sense. We started off going up. So it has to be D and then our y-component of the velocity constantly goes down at a, you know, at a constant slope, right? The slope here is going to be, again, G. So the answer to this Number two is going to be D. All right. So number three says an object with an initial velocity V naught, as shown above, slides up and then down a long frictionless inclined plane. Which of the following is true of the object as it moves? The first option is that it's constant acceleration while moving up the plane and a greater acceleration while moving down the plane. So again, this is... You just have to draw it out and look at the forces acting on the object. The only force that acts on the object um, is going to be the force of gravity, which is going to be directed downward, but a component of it is going to be directed in the direction of the plane, which is going to be mg sine theta. And if you think about it, the quantities of mg sine theta as this object moves up the plane, m stays constant, g stays constant, the theta in here also stays constant, which would mean the acceleration is constant. So for A to claim that the acceleration is greater, that cannot be possible because even as we're going down, this is still gonna stay the same. B says it has constant acceleration while moving up the plane and a smaller acceleration when moving down the plane. Again, same reasoning, not true. C says that it moves with a constant velocity both up and down the plane. This says constant velocity, not acceleration. That's the key word. Velocity does um, decrease as it goes, I mean, depends on how you define it. Uh, the speed decreases initially as we go up. So we don't go at a constant velocity. This object eventually uh, slows down to zero at the top or somewhere near the top. Uh, D says it has the same acceleration as it moves up and down the plane. I like that one. So it's going to be D. We'll just read E. It has, con it has a continually varying acceleration as it moves up and down the plane. 
that's not true. I mean, these, these are constant. This is a constant acceleration, right? Um, th this is a constant force, right? Dividing by m tells us that this is the acceleration. This is constant, okay? All right. Okay, here's number four. Two blocks of masses m1 and m2 are connected by a massless string that passes over a wheel of mass m, as shown above. The string does not slip on the wheel and exerts tensions T1 and T2 on the blocks. When the wheel is released from rest in the position shown, it undergoes an angular acceleration and rotates clockwise. Which of the following statements about T1 and T2 is correct? Okay, so because this is a massless pulley, this because this is not a massless pulley, we need to realize that the tensions on one side of the uh, pulley is not going to be the same. So we got to realize that fact because it could be same, but we just know that it's not necessary for it to be the same, right? If it was massless, we know the tension is the same on both sides. Okay, so because this is the case, if I were to draw a free body diagram, basically they're, they're asking us which of the following statements is correct. One says T1 is equal to T2 because the wheel has mass. I think the best way to work this out is just first to draw out a free body diagram of M1 which feels a M1G force pulling down and an upward force of the tension force, T1. Now, because we're on the same side of the rope, right? That same tension force is going to be pulling down on the pulley at its uh, tangent to the pulley, T1. It's going to be pulling down on it, right? It's kind of like Newton's third law, but not necessarily. It's like one is T1 is pulling up on this, which would mean, uh, which would be the, T1 that's also pulling down on the pulley. Similarly, on the other side, you have M2. With the gra force of gravity pulling down on it and the tension force T2 pulling upwards. Here, same deal. The T2 force is going to be pull the tension force is going to be pulling on the mass 2 block. And that same force is going to be pulling down on the pulley. The reason there's the same again is because we're on the same side of the pulley. So if you think about this, they tell us that it undergoes angular acceleration clockwise. So it travels this way. So if you think about the net torque that's acting on the object, you know, that's a uh, one that's going to be, so if we just think about the radial distance R, right? You don't even think about this. You, just, you can just think of, okay, this is the tension. One is going to create a counterclockwise torque so that's going to be t1 r that's going to be clockwise and t2 t2 r this this is going to create a counterclockwise that is going to create a clockwise torque this is going to create a counter so we have one this one creating a counterclockwise torque and this one's going to be creating a clockwise torque well, what does that mean? That has to mean, because they're acting at the same lever arm, that would have to mean that T2 is greater than, right? So if we look at the options, T1 equals T2 because the wheel has mass. I don't know what that, why that reasoning even makes sense. T1 equals T2 because both blocks have the same acceleration. I mean, again, you, they literally, um, that's true, but um, I don't know how you can prove that. T1 is greater than T2, nope. Uh, T, T1 is greater than T2, no. T2 is greater than T1 because an unbalanced clockwise torque is needed to accelerate the wheel clockwise. Boom. Exact reasoning that I was showing you. So number four is going to be E. All right, number five. Three objects are located on the x-axis as shown above. The center of mass of the object is at x equals. All you have to do is write down the center of mass equation, which is a sum of each mass times its position from whatever origin you're looking at over the total mass that we're looking at the system for. So the each mass we can think of, so here we have three, the mass of three at a distance zero plus five times three plus two times five, okay? Divided by the total mass in the system, 3 plus 5 plus 2. That's going to be equal to, this turns into 0. 5 times 3 is 15. 15 plus 10 is 25 over 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 plus 2 is 10. 
So that gives us 2.5 meters. That's where the center of mass of the system is, and that's D. Okay, so number six says, which of the following is equivalent to the unit of momentum? If we know momentum is equal to M multiplied by V, which is equal to, which in dimensions is kilograms times meters per second, which would imply that, so if we look at joules, joules is force times distance or newtons times meters. And newtons is the same thing as saying um, kilograms meters per second squared because it's mass times acceleration. This is a unit for acceleration. Multiplied by mass would give us kilograms meters cubed over second squared. That's not joules. If we look at newtons, newtons again is kilograms meters per second squared. That's not kilograms meter per second. If we look at joules second, we take newton meter times seconds. Again, that's kilogram meters per second squared times meters times seconds. We get kilograms meters squared over seconds. Again, that's not it because it doesn't match with this. That, this is the momentum, uh, momentum's units. Newton times seconds is kilograms meters per second squared. Multiplied by seconds gives us kilograms meters per second. So there it is. That's the correct unit. It's D. If you wanted, you could have done this simple way and just said that delta V Delta P is equal to impulse, which is equal to force, average force applied across a certain time. And that would also let you know that this is just Newton's time seconds. All right, number seven says, two objects are dropped from rest from the same height. Object A falls through a distance dA during time t, and object B falls through a distance dB during time 2t. If air resistance is negligible, what is the relationship between dA and dB? For this one, I think it's simplest to use kinematics equations. So you're just taking um, delta x equals vit plus one half at squared. That's the easiest equations to look at. And they say that we're dropping it from rest. So this equation just becomes, this part goes to zero because our initial velocity is zero uh, because vi is zero, so that part cancels out and we had one half a t squared. So if we just set dA, right, they say that the object falls through a distance dA if we let it pass through a time t, right? That's what they tell us here. For object B, if we let it pass through a time 2t, then it passes through a distance of dB. So if I just plug in 2t here, that gives us one half a 4t squared is equal to db. So all we have to do to figure out the relationship between dA and db, we can just take dA divided by db. That should be equal to, well, we just plug it in, 1 half a t squared. I'm just rewriting this here, right? Um, divided by 1 half a 4t squared. This would tell us that the 1 halves cancel, the a's cancel, the t squareds cancel and you get one fourth, which would mean that dA is equal to a fourth of dB. So then you get A. Okay, number eight. The, max, the maximum mass that can be hung vertically from a string without breaking the string is 10 kilograms. A length of this string that is two, two meters long is used to rotate a 0.5 kilogram object in a circle on a frictionless table with the string horizontal. The maximum speed that the mass can attain under these conditions without the string breaking is most nearly. For this one, you just have to think about centripetal motion, right? So you have the object moving across in a circle, but it is moving vertically, right? They tell us that it's moving vertically. That's a terrible circle. I'll redraw that. All right, that's even worse, but it's okay. So the maximum mass that can be hung, so this is the tension force that's acting on the object. What you gotta realize is that because this is spinning vertically, the maximum tension that you can attain is always at the bottom. The reason is because if the object was at the bottom, right, not only would you be facing a mg force downwards, if you think about it, you'd force a grip, force of gravity downwards, you'd also force face a tension force upward. Right? And if you write your equations down, you get T minus mg is equal to the net force that acts on the object to provide the acceler centripetal acceleration, which we can say AC. This is just 
Newton's second law, net force is equal to ma. And this is an a. This is the centripetal acceleration. And you look at it, t is equal to mac plus mg. So at the bottom, you have the addition of these two, right? So you know this is where it's going to have the maximum tension for a second that it can sustain. At the top, if you write your equations down again, you have the tension force. You have mg pointing downwards, but the tension is also pointing downwards, which means mg is aiding you in the effort to create the centripetal acceleration. So you can say T plus mg is equal to mac. And so T is equal to mac minus mg. So here you don't have as much of the work being done by the tension force from the string. So it can still, um, you know, this is this is where it can attain its maximum um, maximum breaking point before the string snaps. So, so now that we figured this out, it's asking us what under what conditions. So we're figuring out V max. That's the end goal. Now that we figured out it's going to happen at the bottom, they tell us initially that the maximum mass that can hang vertically from a string without breaking the string is 10 kilograms, which means T max is equal to, well, if a 10 kilogram block is literally sitting on it, MG is going to pull down and T is going to be pulling up. If a 10 kilogram block is what's sitting on it, we have 10 kilograms of mass that is going to supply times gravity. And on the MCQ of the physics C mechanics test, you can approximate gravity to 10. So don't worry about using 9.8. You get 100 newtons. That's the maximum um, tension force that this can sustain without breaking. So in this case, um, we can say, we can rewrite this equation as tension minus mg is equal to mac, which would imply that tension is 100 newtons minus the object that we're rotating has a mass of 0.5. So we have 0 0.5 multiplied by 10 is equal to 0 0.5 times v squared over r. And the r that we're spinning it about is 2. So if I just hit the left side, 100 minus 0 0.5 times 10, 95 multiplied by 0.5. So this is 0.5 divided by 2. So you had 95 on this side is equal to 0.5 divided by 2 is v squared over 4. 95 times 4 is 380 uh, is equal to v squared. Taking the square root of 380 gives us 19 so which would imply that, that v is equal to 19.49 meters per second and the closest answer to that here is 20 so that's d for 20 uh, for number eight okay number nine an object moving on a horizontal frictionless surface makes a glancing collision with another object initially at rest on the surface in this in this case which of the following is true about momentum and kinetic energy because this object collides with another object and we're on a frictionless surface we know that the there's no net forces acting on the system which would imply the momentum is conserved so what what can we say about this momentum has to be conserved so you can already eliminate d because that says momentum is not conserved so it can't be D. Now, you only know kinetic energy is conserved if they tell you, right? There could have been some heat loss or something in the collision, so you don't know for sure if kinetic energy is always conserved. So momentum is always conserved and kinetic energy may be conserved, right? Okay. Kinetic energy is always conserved and momentum may be conserved. That's not correct. Um, C says momentum is always conserved and kinetic energy is never conserved. Not necessarily. So you don't know that. Both momentum and kinetic energy are always conserved in this situation. Not true either. So, you know, only if they tell you, if they don't tell you, you don't know. So it's got to be A because kinetic energy, you don't know if it's always going to be conserved. Okay, number 10 says a particle of mass m starts from rest at position x equals 0 and time t equals zero. It moves along the positive x-axis under the influence of a single force. 
f x equals b times t, where b is a constant. The velocity v of the particle is given by, we know that the force is equal to mass times acceleration, and because force in the x direction they tell us is dt. To figure out acceleration, uh, you just divide by m. Now, the question asks us for velocity. So if you stopped right there and picked A, you would have gotten it wrong, so do not pick it. The next part is taking this and integrating this function. Right? You're going to take, if you multiply by dt on both sides, you get A dt equals dt over m dt. Take the integral of both sides, and we're just taking an indefinite integral, so it's not really a big deal if you do plus e or not. So this is going to give us a velocity is equal to these are constants so these can come out of the integral you have b over m you have the integral of t dt and so you get b over m this is just basic power rule. the calc the physics exam especially for mechanics it's not going to ask you crazy hard calculus that you need to know i mean it, it could be shown up for rotational inertia and stuff but not really a lot in mechanics so you just do t one plus one is two over two this is just some basic power rule stuff so the only thing that matches with this is b i think yeah so again don't worry too much about calculus it's not heavily tested but on the enm exam it's definitely harsher with calculus than mechanics is okay number 11 says three blocks a b and c of masses one two and three kilogram respectively are initially at rest on a frictionless surface as indicated in the figure what force F has to be applied on block C to accelerate the three blocks at two meters per second squared? This one, you just, you just draw a big, big block that has all of these combined technically because we're just pushing on that block. So here you have one plus two plus three is six kilograms. So you're just pushing this entire block at six kilograms. The entire concept is if this accelerates at two meters per second squared, the entire thing has to accelerate at two meters per second squared. That's why I'm able to draw this. And then I can just say F equals MA, and the mass I have is six times A, um, six times two, that gives us 12 newtons. So we're gonna have to push with 12 newtons of force to accelerate C, and all of them at two meters per second squared. So number 12 says an electrical motor provides 0.5 watts of mechanical power. How much time will it take for the motor to lift A 0.1 kilogram mass at a constant speed from the floor to the shelf two meters above the floor. So um, The object is traveling from here to here. We'll say that's two meters of distance as we go from here to here Which would mean right because gravity is going to be pulling down on you and you're applying it at a constant speed the only addition of energy that you put into the system to the block uh, is the change in its gravitational potential energy, which is going to be mgh, which is mass times gravity times height. We push it up two, so that gives us one times two is two joules. You add two joules, right? So we put in two joules into the system in gravitational potential energy as we pull it up. So how long does it take? We know that power is equal to work over time or um, work over time. Right, How, the amount of work we do in a certain amount of time. So we can just take two joules. We apply two joules of uh, amount of work we do in a certain time, which is we don't know what we're solving for, and that must be equal to zero point five watts. So I divide and multiply by two on the other side. We get zero point five times two. Divide. We get t is equal to. Um, dividing by 0 0.5 on both sides that gives us t is equal to four seconds so we take four seconds for the motor to lift this up and give it two joules of energy and again that is only if we're moving it at constant speed if we do put in some energy and this thing has some velocity at, as it at the edge then we have added more than just two joules we have added more to the system so but in this case it's just going to be e Okay, number 13, a block slides down from rest with negligible friction down the track above, descending a vertical height of five meters to point P at the bottom. It then slides on a horizontal, horizontal surface. The coefficient of friction between the block and the horizontal surface is 0 
how far does the block slide on the horizontal surface before it comes to rest? So this is just energy conservation. As this block comes down all the way here, all of its uh, potential energy, gravitation potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. So we can say mgh is equal to one half mv squared, right? All of the kinetic uh, potential energy initially has been converted to this. There is no loss in friction because they tell us that mu not as, mu is equal to zero. So if I just cancel my m's, multiply by two, we get that v is equal to the square root of 2gh. That's the velocity that this object will have at point p. Now, we know that mu is equal to 0 0.2. So, well, thinking about that, they were asking how far does the block slide before, uh, it's, before it comes to rest. You have initial kinetic, so if you think about initial energy, so right after this, right, you have energy, whatever you have initial, minus minus the work done by the friction force would give us zero energy in the system. So here initially we had some energy and that was all in the form of kinetic energy and that got converted to zero some distance away, right? So some energy initially and it was some of it was taken away by friction and that led us finally to zero joules of energy in the end. So initially we had one half um, and then rather than using V, we'll just use this quantity. Two G H squared minus the work done by friction for this, you're going to have to do force times distance, but here the force that's acting on it is friction. So you can do the normal force, right? Multiplied by mu naught. That's going to give you the force of friction multiplied by the distance we travel, which we're trying to solve for is equal to zero. You can simplify further by saying that Fn is equal to mg because that's the normal force by mu naught. That gives you the frictional force multiplied by the distance we act on as a work. So if we add it on both sides, we get one half. And if I take the square of a square root, it gives me 2gh is equal to mg mu mu d. Canceling the m's, canceling the g's, uh, canceling the 2's. So we get h is equal to mu d and h over mu is equal to d so this is the distance that the object travels so it all just comes down to okay what height did i have five meters over mu naught which was 0 0.2 and that gives me what is five zero by 0.2 that's 25 so we travel a total distance of 25 meters before coming to rest this is kind of crazy because this kind of lets you know that um, literally nothing about the mass even matters and it doesn't even matter what what the gravity is right so it's kind of crazy to think about all right 14 the graph above shows velocity as a function of time for an object moving along a straight line for which of the following synergy of the graph is acceleration constant and non-zero so this is a velocity versus time graph if we take the derivative of velocity we get we get acceleration so if we take the derivative here in the section p to q we, we see that acceleration is zero because the slope is zero so it cannot be pq anything with a pq in it is wrong so it cannot be e or c right okay what about qr you can see that the tangent lines here are actually changing so it looks like this if i were to enlarge it qr if you take the derivative of velocity right the tangent lines of the thing right it changes i mean this is kind of terrible but the t you can see that the slopes constantly changes each time which would mean the a isn't constant so cannot be qr so you're left with just b or d now let's look at the next next portion r to s do we have a non-zero slope that's correct this is not zero and it's constant across this entire segment the slope is always constant look at this we have some constant value that is not equal to zero same thing with from s to t it's not equal to zero. It's some value that's not equal to zero. From t to u, though, we go back to acceleration equaling zero. So the sections are rs and st. They both work. So it's going to be d. All right, number 15. The velocity of a particle moving along the x-axis is given as a function of time by the expression v of t is equal to 3t squared minus 2t plus 4, where v is in meters per second and t is in seconds. What is the acceleration of the particle at time t equals two seconds? 
again dv dt derivative of velocity with respect to time is equal to acceleration so we just take the derivative of v of t which gives us with power rule that 2 comes down 3 times 2 is 6t minus 2 is probably one of the easier questions on the test at time t equals 2 we just plug it in 6 times 2 2 is 12 12 minus 2 is 10 so the object's going to have two, 10 meters per second squared of acceleration. So number 16 and 17 are both uh, part of the same question. An unstretched ideal spring hangs vertically from a fixed support. A 0.5 kilogram object is then attached to the lower end of the spring. So it's like we have something that's just standing still, and then now we attach some block to it, which is 0.4 kilograms. The object is then pulled down a distance. So now, after attaching it, we stretch it a certain distance. If this was our equilibrium, we stretch it a distance of uh, 0.35 meters from its unstretched position and released. So now it's going to oscillate back and forth. It's going up and down and up and down, right? It's going to go, it's, it's basically going to have an amplitude of 0.35 meters. A graph of the subsequent vertical position y at the lower end of the spring as a function of t is given above. We're, we're, y equals zero when the spring is initially unstretched. So here that is, that's like, that's this. Right now, as, as soon as we hang it, we get some stretch and then we just stretch it. So basically it stretches to this point, right? Um, I don't know if this is right, but we stretch it to some point and then we let it go. So it just goes back and forth. Okay. So they're saying which of the following times is the upward velocity of the object the greatest? Well, you just have to look at the slope of this, right? If you just look at the slopes here, so here it's going to be zero, so that times t equals zero, it's going to be zero. 0.25, so here's 0.5. So here we have the greatest um, velocity because, again, this, this is at equilibrium, right? That line is equilibrium. That's what it sing, swings back and forth from, right? So there that is, and at 0.25, yes, we do have an upward facing velocity because this derivative is gonna be positive, which would again imply velocities upwards. So I like B a lot, uh, I can automatically reject A. What about at 0.5, it's zero, that's not gonna be correct. 0.75, that is a good guess because this does have the greatest velocity but it's in the opposite, I mean, I shouldn't say that. It has a greatest speed, but it's in the opposite direction. So th this is pointing downwards. We're going farther down. It's like when the thing is trying to go down now. As soon as it reaches equilibrium at 0.25, we're going up. So it can't be D in one second. It's like, again, zero. So the answer to 16 is going to be B. 17 says, what is the spring constant of the spring? So... According to our equations, omega, the angular uh, angular velocity is equal to square root of k over m. This is also equal to 2 pi f or 2 pi over t. So solving for this, we get that if we multiply omega is equal to 2 pi t, oh, sorry, 2 pi over t. Actually, we don't need to do that. We can just set these two equal to each other. We can say that square root of k over m is equal to 2 pi over t. Squaring both sides gives us k over m is equal to 4 pi squared over t squared. And so when we solve um, for k, right, you just have to multiply by m, which tells us that k is equal to 4 pi squared over t squared multiplied by m. So k is equal to pi squared. The period here is, okay, so if we just go from one point to another point, right, we're going down here, going down at this point, the period here, 0 0.5, here, that's 1.5 so we have a period of one second right is it that's how long it took so we have one squared also by the mass of the object 0 0.4 kilogram they tell us that right here so 0 0.4 all of that simplified tells us that k is 4 pi squared times 0.4 that gives us 15.79 that's closest to a so 17 is going to be A. 18 says identical net forces 
act for the same length of time on two different spherical masses? Oh, I didn't crop this right. This is part of the next question, so don't worry about this. Identical net forces act for the same length of time on two different spherical masses. Which of the following best describes the change in linear momentum of the smaller mass compared to that of the larger mass? Change in momentum is equal to impulse or the force that's acting on it, integral of the force that acts on it. So if you think about this, um, you know the dp dt is equal to force uh, net f net. So we just multiply, right? This is basically the derivation for how they got impulse, right? So impulse, change in momentum, is equal to the integral of force times time. And it, the simpler way to look at this, 4 times dt. The simpler way to look at this is just saying the average force multiplied by a certain change in time, time interval. So because we have the same force that's acting on the object, this is going to be the same, and in the same time frame, the change in momentum is going to be the same for both of these uh, spherical masses. This is a very similar scenario to when these two, when two objects collide with one another, right? According to Newton's third law, they both feel a force on each other. They're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction because the magnitude of the forces, magnitude of the time, is the same. Right, in a collision, the magnitude of the change in the momentum of the two object is also going to be the same. So that's, that's basically a concept. That's the entire concept they're testing in this question. So it cannot be smaller, it's not larger, it's equal to. So 18 is going to be C. Okay, number 19 says, the uniform thin rod shown above has mass M and length L. The momentum of inertia of the rod about an axis through its center and perpendicular to the rod is 1 12th ML squared. What is the amount of inertia of the rod? What is the moment of inertia of the rod about an axis perpendicular to the rod and passing through point P, which is halfway between the center and the end of the rod? So here you just have to use a parallel axis theorem, which states that if we just shift it a certain distance from the center of mass that we're rotating it about, you just have to do the inertia for on the center for about the center of mass plus mass of the object times D, the distance that we move it squared. It's going to be the final inertia of the object. So here, initially across the center, right, um, you have 1 12th ml squared. Plus, now we move it a distance here from the center, a distance of L over 4. That's because this entire part is L over 2. So if you take L over 2 minus this L over 4, you take L over 2 minus L over 4, that gives you L over 4. So we move it a distance. We just change the axis of rotation. We shifted it uh, by a distance of L over 4. So we can just write M times L over 4 squared is equal to I final. Uh, here, this just becomes 1 12th ML squared plus ML squared over 16. If we just add 1 12th and 1 16th on a calculator, that gives us 7 over 48 ml squared. That's going to be the final moment of inertia of the object if it's rotating about this end. All right, question 20 is saying a certain one-dimensional conservative force is given as a function of x by the expression f equals negative kx cubed, where f is in newtons and x is in meters. A possible potential energy function u for this force is, you know the potential energy is equal to the integral of force um, force times the distance we travel, but negative, so the change in this, right? Take the integral of negative kx cubed dx, and we have a negative here. These negatives become a positive. This is going to be equal to the change in potential energy, and you just get kx to the fourth over 4. So this is going to be d. Okay, number 21. Which of the following is a differential equation that correctly describes Newton's second law for a simple harmonic oscillator of mass m and restoring force constant k. Um, the force that acts in a simple harmonic oscillator is negative kx. So this is equal to 
ma so write a differential equation all you have to write is just rewrite a as the second derivative of position with respect to time there it is uh, and so the only thing that matches is b so don't get freaked out by the differential part they ask this a lot in frqs all you have to do is just replace the a or the v with just a position the respective to position that's all you need to do you don't have to worry about it okay 22 says the elliptical orbit of a comet is shown above position one and two are respectively the farthest and the nearest position to the sun and position one the distance from the comet to the sun is 10 times that at position two uh so all they're saying is if we see the distance here is d the distance from the sun to this would be 10 d right it's 10 times that at the distance from sun to position two so at position two the comet's kinetic energy is well if you think about it um the l angular momentum is conserved in the situation right which is going to be r cross p which is going to be equal to l well at 10 d right we know for a fact that the radius is greatest here right i mean that's pretty obvious and at two the radius is smallest here because they tell us that we know also that the angular momentum has to be conserved because there are no net external forces acting or no net external torques acting on the system so because of that fact uh these are vectors by the way given that fact all we have to do and say well because this is concerned we just have mvr this is a rewritten way to say this and at position one our m stays constant we'd have to look at that the r was the greatest here which would have to make v the smallest the reason is because again moment angular momentum is conserved and at position two We have MVR, and here the radius is the smallest, which would make the V the largest. And because kinetic energy is equal to one half MV squared, we know for a fact that at position one, we have the lowest kinetic energy, and at position two, we have the highest kinetic energy. So it's not the same, it's not the less, that's its maximum value for the orbit at position two. Question 23 now says, what is a ratio V1 over V2 of the speed of the comet at position 1 to the speed at position 2? Again, you can just say that linear momentum, uh, sorry, angular momentum initially must be equal to the angular momentum final. And here, uh, the angular momentum is R cross P, right? And here we also add R cross P. Let's say that here the position is, we'll say that position, the angular moment of position one must be equal to position two. So at position one, we had MVR, and at position two, we had same thing, MVR, right? But to give better subscript, this is V1, R1 is equal to MV2, R2. We can cancel out the masses, and we know that V1, and then the radius at v1 here and as we previously said that was 10 d and here this is d so if we just replace this with 10 d and replace this with d the d's can go away right and we get that v1 over v2 is equal to 1 over 10 so the answer to 23 is 24 says elliptical orbit of a comet is shown above position one and two are respectively the farthest blah 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 so this is 10 let's write that again 10 d and this is d what is the ratio f1 over f2 of the force on a comet at position one to the force on the co position at comet uh at, on the comet at position two you just have to take the force of gravity at position one and two so the force of gravity at position one is g m1 m2 or the mass of the sun, right? You have that over, and we, we just call this m, and the mass of the sun. So we have m and the mass of the sun over r squared. Well, here we have 
10 d is our r squared over g m over here and m of the sun over uh, d squared here because the radius is d compared to 10 d over here so the d g's can cancel the m's can cancel the sun and mass of the suns can cancel and we get one over a hundred d squared over one over d squared if we were to bring the d on top you get d squared over a hundred d squared and then these can cancel and you get one over 100 and that should make sense because the force here is definitely larger so it cannot be cd or e and it has to be e I mean, you can cross cd e off immediately because there's no way that the force can be greater than one I mean, the ratio of the forces can't be greater than 1. So it can't be, it has to be A. Okay. A block of mass M is pulled across a rough surface as shown above. The coefficient of friction between the block and the surface is mu k. The force F that pulls a block is exerted at the angle phi shown. Which of the following is an expression for the magnitude of the frictional force on the block if it is moving at a constant speed? We know that the force of friction is equal to the normal force multiplied by mu. Here, the normal force is the force that the floor exerts on the block, right? If we have, so if we just draw a free body diagram, I feel a mg force downward and an upward normal force. Now, the normal force basically counteracts whatever it gets pushed on itself by. So, because we're applying a force in this direction, the only force that the normal force experience is the difference between mg and the vertical component of this. The reason is because f sine theta, f sine phi, right? that aids that helps normal force because we are in the direction so it doesn't have to push up as hard because this is already uh, decreasing mg by a certain amount so if we just take mg minus f sine phi that gives us normal force and to go back to force of friction that's equal to normal force multiplied by mu so you replace this you get mg minus f sine phi times mu so the only option that connects with that is E. Okay, two four kilogram blocks hang from a rope that passes over the two frictionless pulleys as shown in the figure above. What is the tension in the horizontal portion of the rope if the blocks are not moving and the rope and the two pulleys are negligible, have negligible mass? Again, because these are negligible, the pulleys, the tension across the rope is gonna be the same. So if we just look at this four kilogram block, this is one of these four kilogram blocks, we know that there is a mg force pulling down on it and a tension force pulling up on it this is all we have to solve for the tension force and because this thing is not moving the system is not moving we know that mg minus the tension force is equal to ma and because this is zero no acceleration this entire thing here becomes zero mg then equals t which would imply that we have four times ten is equal to t so that gives us that tension is equal to 40 newtons uh, so that's going to be D. All right, 27 said it was a ball of mass, 0.2 kilograms. The ball starts from rest and accelerates from accelerates horizontally and uniformly through a distance of 0.9 meters and leaves a person's hand at 30 meters per second. The average force, horizontal force applied to the ball by the person's hand is, well, we know that the object, after traveling a distance of 0 0.9 meters, it left with a speed of 30 meters per second, which would mean then that the change in kinetic energy is supplied by the force done, force across a distance, because the object leaves um, the thing with 30 meters per second. We know that's one half delta V one half uh, VF squared minus VI squared. It's equal to the force that's applied, which is um, so, which is the average force that's applied across a distance of 0 0.9. So solving for this, one half 
mass is 0 0.2 and we're left with 30 meters we don't start with any initial velocity we just have 30 squared is equal to 0 0.9 is equal to the force average plugging this into the calculator we get this gives us the answer that 28 says a railroad car of mass 1500 kilogram rolls to the right at 40 meters per second and collide with another railroad car of mass 3000 kilograms rolling to the left at 3 meters per second the cars stick together their speed immediately after the collision is one sec my pen is not working i'll be right back okay never mind it's working now so here is the 1500 kilogram object it's moving to the right at four meters per second and the other one of 3000 kilogram that's moving to the left at three meters per second so if we regard to the right as positive and the left as a negative we can just write our uh, conservation momentum because again no external forces so we can just solve uh, for the collision so uh, we get 1500 multiplied by four to the right plus initial this is initial momentum all of this I'm gonna write down is initial momentum so you have 3,000 and the velocity is gonna be negative 3 because that's the velocity vector is pointed to the left again we regarded that as negative you could have swapped it and you could have said that this is negative and this is positive but it still worked out fine and so all of that is equal to well because they tell us that they stick together I'm gonna to move this to the right a little bit because they tell us that they stick together we can say that the total mass both travel with the same speed so now this just becomes 1500 plus 3000 all of this mass together they move with the final velocity so if i just divide by this quantity on both sides we get vf is equal to That gives us this is negative two thirds meters per second but again they're asking for speed so we only want the absolute value of this and that's a okay 29 says a meter stick of negligible mass is placed on a fulcrum at the 0 0.4 meter mark with a one kilogram mass hung at the zero mark so if i were to draw this and a 0.5 kilogram mass hung at the one meter mark so here we go we have the fulcrum here and this is hung at the 0 0.4 meter mark uh, and a one kilogram mass is hung at the one meter mark, uh, zero meter mark so here's the here's a one kilogram mass hung at a zero meter mark so this is zero meters 0.4 meters and a 0.5 kilogram mass is hung at the one meter mark so here's all the way at the end we have the mass of a 0.5 kilogram block that's hung at that's hung here at one meters so the magnitude of the net torque on the object okay so to figure out the net torque let's figure out this you just have to take r cross r cross f for each of these so if i just do that so the r is um well from here to here the from the axis of rotation to the ax the line of action of the force that's a distance the radius that's a lever arm of 0 0.4 meters times the force that's acting on it well that's 1 times 10 because mg this is mg right force times radius so this is force times radius that's all i did i just multiply them how to get the sine right you're gonna have to use your right hand rule the equation says torque is equal to r cross f so you point in the direction so in this case you point in the direction of r which is this and and the direction of f so you cross your hands if i put my hand in the direction of r and cross it my thumb points out of the page so if we say the out of the page is positive we multiply this by a positive one that's it and then we and then we add uh we add this this object um keep that blank for the sign but we'll figure out this this objects 
mass is the force that it applies is 0 0.5 times 10 mg at a distance here to here 0 0.6 right because this is a 0 0.4 mark if we just take 1 minus 0 0.4 that gives us 0 0.6 so and again do the same thing here point in the direction of r and draw the direction of the force now point your direction in the direction of r cross it to f that tells me that the my thumb points into the page so we can just and because we defined out of the page is positive and into the page is negative this is going to be have a negative sign so so if we add if we multiply this we get 0.5 times 10 is 5 times 5 times 0.6 is 3 this is negative 3 um, and here we get just we just get 4 so that gives us 1 newton meter of torque so it's going to be a now you didn't even have to do the right hand rule you could have just said hey look um, this creates a clockwise torque sorry counterclockwise torque so I'm going to assign some um, assign to it so I'm going to call it positive and you could have said this hey look this creates a clockwise torque so that's going to be negative for me you could have flipped the signs it doesn't really matter just I personally like the right hand rule uh, the most because you use it a lot in E and M. Turn is going to be A. Okay, 30 says an object undergoes simple harmonic motion. Uh, simple harmonic motion, very important. I highly recommend that you guys start underlining things in these questions because they are very useful. The simple harmonic motion is going to come in key along the x axis shown above, where x equals 0 is the object's equilibrium position. Which of the following graphs? best shows a relationship between the object's acceleration a and its displacement x from the equilibrium you know for a fact that if it's going through simple harmonic motion a has to be directly proportional to x right but in this case we have uh so we have negative kx right if negative kx is directly proportional to this because force of us because X, uh, force that it acts upon is directly proportional to the displacement we are from the equilibrium and that's why the force from a spring or something is always negative kx so if we just divide by mass right to get acceleration some mass that tells us that the slope negative k over m and the so because this is x the slope here has to be negative k over m we should imply that the slope has to be negative and constant, right? I like A because it's negative and it's constant. B is positive. I don't like that. C says the slope changes for some reason. I don't know why. D says it's not possible. And E says it's not possible. Now, again, right? It's very important that you realize that this there has to be a negative here. A very much so because a conservative force acts it always uh, away it always tries to pull it toward equilibrium so when you're at a high positive x position the negative acceleration indicates like like over here the force is going to be pointing toward the left that's what even gives you the simple harmonic motion as you're here the force pulled you back as you're here right when i'm here the positive acceleration pulls you to the right which would indicate a you know a conservative force acting on the system but here it says i have a positive x and i have a positive acceleration that would imply then look if i'm here then my force also points to the right which would mean i'll just keep going out and out it, there's no simple harmonic motion in that case so very important that you pick uh you pick a because b is, and the sign is very important so keep that in mind one last five problems so this one says ball one is dropped from rest at time t equals zero from a tower by h as shown above at the same time at the same instant ball two is launched upward from the ground with an initial speed v naught if air resistance is negligible at what time t will the two balls pass each other what i think is the most important is i'm just gonna say that well the the, the moment that they pass or the distance that they pass at i'll just call this y this is where this reaches this point and that's also where this thing reaches and they both meet so looking at our kinematics equation delta y is equal to v i t plus one half a t squared and if we look at delta y the position this object undergoes right from here to here final y minus initial y the final y is y 
and our initial y is h. So we we have y minus h. Now this is the first ball. Again, we're doing the first ball here. The top ball. Now this is going to be equal to vit. Now we're dropping it from rest. So this is this this part goes away. This term goes away. We have one half at squared, and rather than a, I'm just going to replace it with g because that's what really accelerates this system. So let's do the same equation for the second ball now. So if we look at this, when it goes from here to here, right, um, the change in height, well, we started with 0 and we went to y. So we do final y minus initial y. Final y is just y. Initial y is 0. So we need to say y is equal to vit. This does have initial velocity plus 1 half gt squared. Look, now we have y here and a y here. So I can just replace the y into that. And that tells me VOT plus 1 half GT squared minus H is equal to 1 half GT squared. And if I subtract 1 half GT squared from both sides, this part cancels with this. And I get V naught T is equal to H and T is equal to H over V naught. So the answer to this is going to be C. All right, 32 is one of the harder questions, I think, on the entire to MCQ section. So let's go ahead and do this. Suppose the potential energy of a particle constrained to move is of a particle constrained to move along the x-axis can be described by the function u of x is equal to one half kx squared minus ax, where both a, k, and a are positive constants, stable equilibrium points about which the particle oscillates are located at. What you got to realize is that this is a potential energy function as you go across, you know, as you move across the x-axis. And you can only move in the x-axis, so we don't have to worry about y. Now, the crucial thing to realize is that this is a parabola. So if I were to graph u of x against x, right, if you think about the properties of a parabola, Right. I think this is one I would memorize for the AP Physics E exam, is the axis of symmetry is at negative b over 2a, right? That's where a thing like, it's where the axis of symmetry occurs on the x-axis. So, so if I just plug in my b, which is alpha, alpha over 2 times a, well, the a here is 1 half k, and that tells us that negative negative alpha makes it a positive. We get alpha over k. Now, that's the point where this parabola, I don't know what it looks like. It could be going through the z -ax, zero axis. I mean, I'm not really sure what it looks like, but I know for a fact that this is where the object will have the lowest potential energy because this these are positive this is a positive constant. They literally tell you that, which means this is an upward facing parabola. Because of that one reason, you can say that this has to be the point of lower potential, lowest potential, uh, because it's a parabola and this is its, its upward facing. And the other thing to note is that the force that's acting on this object will always point toward lower potential. So if I have an object here, the force will point to the right because that's where the lowest potential is. It's right here, right? That's what conservative forces do. They always want to point toward lower potential. And I'm if I'm here, I don't want to point toward the left, right? Because this is where it always wants to go. I mean, think about it. If you have an object on a hill, gravity is a conservative force. It always wants to point toward lower potential. It wants to go here where it is the lowest potential. It has the lowest potential there, right? So. Because force always points toward lower potential, you know for a fact this is where it's going to stay at equilibrium, right? If I let it go here, it's going to go, it's always going to try to go here, right? I mean, it's, it's not a hill because it's on the x axis. So if you think about it, if I let this is the point where it's alpha over uh, k, if I let go of a particle here, it's going to go here. If I let go of a particle here, it's going to go here. So it's always going to oscillate about some axis. I mean, it depends, but this is where. It's going to be, uh, this is where it's going to have its equilibrium point because once it's here, the force doesn't really do anything. Anywhere else you let it be, it always wants to go here, right? So keep that in mind. So the answer to this is going to be B because that's the only place where it has uh, 
static equilibrium the object oscillates at. Okay, so 33. I think this one's more of a tricky question, in my opinion, because of the wording. So, a ball of mass M falls vertically, hits the floor with speed VI, and rebounds with the speed VF. So, if we have the floor here, it hits the floor with speed VI, and rebounds with the speed VF. What is the magnitude of the impulse exerted on the ball by the floor? Easy, right? You'd be like, all right, bro, change in momentum is equal to what? Um, force multiplied by, oh, sorry. Yeah, you have to say change in momentum is equal to M times change in V. So I know this is M VF minus VI. So I'm just going to plug it in, right? We have VI, they gave it to me. Boom, this is the answer. I'm going to pick B and I'm done, right? But if you do that, you're going to get the question wrong. What you have to realize is that these quantities here, these are vector, these are velocities, but they give you speed, right? That's that's very important to note. They didn't give you velocity. If they gave you velocity, you could just say that uh, you could say B and B done, but they gave you speed. So we're going to have to define a coordinate system and solve this. So if, if we define up to be positive and down to be negative, we can do the same thing, right? This would be, this is still correct. Uh, we just have m vf but vf is a vector right it has both magnitude and direction the magnitude of vf is vf because that's what they gave to us that's the that's the magnitude right and the sign attached to it that's what gives it the vector right so because it's pointing up we're going to give it a positive now that's the this is what the vector is equivalent to right now we're going to subtract the VI vector. So the VI vector is because it's pointing down, right? We give it a negative symbol or I'll do it this order, which is better. You first give it its magnitude because vectors have magnitude and sign. So first the magnitude, but now attach the sign because that's what this equals, right? We just have an equal sign. We got to make them equal, man. So it's the magnitude. We got we got the magnitude right now. We got to give it its direction. It's pointing down. So I'm going to give it the negative symbol. So because we have two negatives here, we get M VF plus VI. So the answer now is actually C. So always be careful, right? Sometimes they give you speed. It, it, it's almost easy to just do it quickly and get it over with. Always think about what a vector means because I think that's the entire trick in this question. If you get the vector wrong, you get the question wrong. Almost everyone picks B and they just get it wrong. All right, 34 and 35, last two problems. A particle moves in a circle in such a way that the X and Y coordinates of its motions are given in meters as functions of time T in seconds are X equals five cosine three T, Y equals five sine of three T. If you take, if you know parametrics or in, you're in Calc BC, you should be able to realize that this is a circle. If you were to graph it, it looks like this, right? With the radius of five. The reason, I mean, it's just because it's moving in a circle and as time progresses, the X position, right? As time goes on, the X position gets smaller and the Y position gets larger, reaching its maximum value of five here. And similarly, the Y position gets, uh, y position gets to zero and you reach negative five it just goes on and on right so it just goes around this circle that's basically it so the radius here is going to be see i think the easiest way is to just use parametrics i'm not sure of another way that might be simpler but i, th I think parametrics might be the easiest because i think all of you guys who have taken who are taking physics e should be taking should know parametrics unless you're an a b i don't know how that would work I mean, again, like I said, you could just think about it graphically. So, yeah, it's probably the best way to think about it. Which of the following is true of the speed of the particle. Now, this one's a little trickier. You have to realize that this is going in a circle, which would mean it's going in centripetal motion, right? And you know that um, because this is moving in a centripetal motion, the speed stays constant. It's always, it's always the same across each point. All that happens is that the X component 
goes some of the x component goes to the y component it just keeps going back and forth between them but the speed is always the same so if you were to take right the if you were you can graph this if you take dx dt squared plus dy dt squared and if you graph this as a function on your calculator you can do that uh, that's not good notation. If we just graph this as a function of of time on your calculator, because this is speed, you will always see that, right? This is the derivative. Second, I, all I'm doing, right? This is probably the easiest way to think about it. You, I'm just taking the x position squared plus a y position squared, taking the square uh, root, uh, sorry, the set, the v, v x and v y so i'm taking the velocity in the x position squared plus the velocity in the y position squared taking the square root that's all i'm doing that gives me the speed right pythagorean theorem so if i graph this you will see that this always equals 15 meters per second if you want you can think of it like this if i take dx dt that's going to be equal to five uh negative sine 3t times 3 so that's going to be equal to negative 15 so the maximum value in the x position is going to be the maximum velocity in the x uh, x direction is going to be 15 meters per second and which would also mean the total speed also has to match the, the maximum speed in one direction because like at this point you only have the maximum 15 meters per second all of it has been transferred to x and as you go down and down like over here you only have uh, y positions velocity so so the answer to this is going to be b so the answer to 34 is c and 35 is b all right so we just ended up finishing all of 2012's mcq for mechanics if you guys do want uh me to go over probable frqs or something just leave it in the comments below i'll try to go over them but thanks for tuning in to today's live stream hopefully it was very helpful for you guys um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you.